I think I think by now probably we will be we just have everybody now here. So so guys, I mean it is my great pleasure to have uh, Budemin Hamzi with us. I have known Budemin maybe for half a year or something. Budemin maybe a bit longer. Yeah, no, yeah. And, maybe one year. Yes. And he is doing, uh, I think, a very deep and exceptional work in the field that is not that popular now, but should be. And he's trying to merge the fields of dynamical systems with the field of machine learning, uh, but in a non-trivial way. Um, in particular, he's interested in um, analyzing and formulating uh, dynamical systems in what we call feature spaces uh, that's related to kernel machines in, in machine learning. I, I think that's, that's a great idea. So I'm very much looking forward to what Budemin will tell us. I think Budemin, you are um, a Marie Kiris Kodoska fellow, right? At yes, Imperial. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so this talk is going to be recorded. So if you have any objections, I think um, um, you just need to be aware of this. And, and uh, uh, with regards to questions, I think. I suggest that you just put questions in the chat box, but I'm going to concentrate on Budemin's talk. So unless it's really, really urgent, I would like to ask you to ask questions after Budemin finishes his talk. Yeah. Okay. All right. And okay. so Budemin, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so today I'm going to give a summary of uh, some work that I've been doing for uh, about the last 10 years on the intersection of machine learning and dynamical systems. And uh, yeah, so it's a joint work with <coughs> many people. And then the, the goal here is to show that there is a interaction or intersection of machine learning and dynamical systems in a particular kind of uh, Hilbert spaces, which are called uh, producing kind of Hilbert spaces. So, yeah, so as Peter mentioned, I mean, the, yeah, the, the goal is to combine between the theories of dynamical systems and uh, machine learning. And then the goal here is uh, to uh, propose a database, the qualitative theory of dynamical systems for analysis uh, prediction uh, of nonlinear systems as well as, uh, as control. Yeah, so, <coughs> and the approach is to view uh, producing canary spaces as linearizing spaces. And uh, by linearization, we mean that uh, we'll be uh, embedding nonlinear systems in a particular kind of uh, Hilbert spaces which are called reproducing kind of Hilbert spaces where linear system theory will be uh, applied. And uh, the main motivation is that working in uh, reproducing kind of Hilbert spaces allows uh, to find a nonlinear version of uh, algorithms that can be expressed in terms of, uh, of inner uh, products. So, um, and the outline is uh, as follows. <coughs> so I'll be starting, at, uh, I'll start talking about uh, function approximation in uh, reproducing kind of Hilbert spaces. Then we talk about uh, probability measures in LKHS as well as the maximum mean discrepancy, which is a metric between uh, probability measures. Then I will talk about uh, one of the fundamental problems in kernel methods, which is the problem of uh, kernel selections. And then I shall be talking about kernel flaws for uh, learning uh, chaotic dynamical systems. Uh, then I will talk about uh, detection of uh, critical transitions for uh, some slow fast uh, SDEs. Uh, then I will talk about uh, nonlinear control systems in uh, producing kind of spaces and then how can they, they can be approximated uh, using uh, tools from linear control theory. And same thing will be for uh, social solutions of the Poker Planck equation of some uh, nonlinear SDEs. Then we talked about <coughs> construction of the opponent functions in producing kind of spaces. Then finally, we talk about uh, approximation of center manifolds as well as uh, a database. Uh, theorem for a center manifold. Yeah, so the summary of the approach is that we assume that there is a, a mapping from Rn into H where H is a reproducing kind of space. And then we perform an analysis in general, but not necessarily a linear analysis in, in H. And the goal there is to uh, simplify the, the computations and the analysis in general, uh, and then get some conclusion there and then come back to, to Rn. So the embedding or the transformation phi is obtained from, uh, from the kernel that defines the RKHS. So uh, in general, uh, it's not necessary to explicitly find the phi. And then in practice, we'll be using uh, the canonical feature map uh, that is defined as, uh, as follows. So phi i x is equal to kx 
uh, x of ti. So k is a function of two variables. So uh, one of the, the variables will be, uh, <coughs> will be the measurements. So, the, so in here, I mean, essentially, the measurements will be used uh, to construct uh, Hilbert space where uh, computations uh, become simpler. And uh, yeah, people who are familiar with quantum mechanics, I mean, they already see a flavor of quantum mechanics here because the, the there I means, yeah, you construct a uh, Hilbert space from the data and then you analyze the system there and then you come back with conclusions about the system. So yes, I see some, uh, I mean, there are some connections there, I mean, at least uh, philosophically speaking. <laughs> Okay, so what are they? I mean, they are uh, this reproducing kind of Hilbert spaces. Before anything else, uh, they are uh, Hilbert spaces uh, that uh, appeared in the 30s as an answer to the question: When is it possible to embed the metric space into Hilbert space? So, so you already see here that uh, metric spaces are, are yeah, so are are um, encoding uh, nonlinearities, and then people in the 30s. Uh, because the computer computational power was not that high, were interested in uh, performing linear computations by flattening the space and so moving into uh, into Hilbert space. And then the answer was that if the metric uh, satisfies certain conditions, uh, it is possible to embed a metric space into <coughs> special kind of Hilbert spaces, which are called uh, reproducing kind of Hilbert spaces. And then there was uh, have been a lot of work on this. Uh, uh, this kind of, of spaces in the 50s uh, through the work of Aaron Jan and then uh, Schwartz in, in, in the 60s and, and later on. Yeah. yeah, so what are they? I mean, they are Hilbert spaces before anything else with uh, two uh, extra properties. Uh, first one is the producing property, uh, which is the property I here uh, that reminds us of the property of the Dirac function. But uh, yeah, the Dirac function doesn't really, uh, is, is not a proper reproducing kernel for technical reasons. But at least we have this reproducing property in the sense that the evaluation functional uh, here. So if you want to evaluate a function at a point, you just take the inner product of f with the kernel. And the, the second uh, property is that the yeah the closure of the span is uh, dense in h. So in in other words, uh, a producing kernel is uh, a producing kernel Hilbert space is a Hilbert space with a producing kernel whose span is uh, is dense in h. And then equivalently here, an LKHS is a Hilbert space of a function where all evaluation functionals are bounded and linear. And this is where uh, the Dirac function uh, fails because it's not, uh, it's not a bounded uh, evaluation uh, function. <coughs> so important properties of uh, reproducing kernels are that the LKHS is unique. So the feature map doesn't have to be, um, yeah, the, the feature map doesn't have to be unique, but the LKHS is unique. Uh, we have symmetry, we have uh, positive definiteness, uh, and then we also have this property, uh, the last one that kxy uh, writes as the inner product of kx dot with ky dot in h. And uh, you see, this is exactly what uh, we were looking for from the beginning, which is embedding the metric space into a Hilbert space. So we, are able, we, we essentially want to write down kxy as the inner product of two objects in h. And this is what leads uh, immediately to the canonical feature map, which is uh, PCX is equal to KX dot. And then it's coming from, from, uh, from this property here. Uh, Mercer kernel is a continuous positive definite kernel. So it just uh, add an extra assumption of continuity on, on the kernel. And the fact that Mercer kernels are positive, uh, definite and symmetric reminds us of uh, similar properties of Gramians and covariance matrices. And uh, this is uh, something that we'll be using uh, a lot in, uh, in this work. Uh, examples of kernels are <coughs> monomials, uh, Gaussians, and the hyperbolic tangent. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll be using uh, some of this in the computations. Another way to find uh, the, the embeddings from the, uh, from the kernel is by considering the integral operator associated to the kernel that is defined by uh, the following integral operator. Then one looks at uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions of this integral operator. And then we see uh, that this is uh, kxx prime, we'll write according to, to what we are interested in. So that's Mercer theorem. So uh, since k is positive definite, the lambda j's will be positive definite. And so we can write down the lambda j's in the, this decomposition as the square root of lambda j uh, times P, cj of x times square root of lambda j cj of, uh, of x prime. And this is exactly what's going to give us the, the Mercer embedding, which is defined by the square root of lambda i psi of k. So, so that's one way. That's another way actually of finding the, the embedding. 
So a fee is not unique and depends on, on the measure. And uh, in, in general, it's difficult to compute. But as I mentioned before, I mean, one doesn't have to go uh, uh, through that way. Uh, and one can, can use the canonical feature map. Uh, so it's not necessary to invoke measure uh, theorem just for discussing the feature maps. And uh, these are like just examples of <coughs> how to compute uh, non measure feature maps uh, using the canonical feature map. So for a polynomial kernel, for example, one could uh, just uh, expand this uh, in a product uh, and then uh, we'll, one will get the, the embedding uh, yeah, just through direct computation. And same thing for the Gaussian kernel, one could get immediately the expression of the embedding uh, through just the expansion. Uh, so Mercer theorem is however fundamental to find error estimates and uh, study the smoothing properties of kernels. Uh, but as I mentioned, I will not uh, be talking about this uh, theoretical work in, in, the, in this presentation. So uh, RKHS uh, play a role, <coughs> important role in uh, approximation theory where the goal is uh, to learn a function, an unknown function f from random samples. Uh, and uh, so the usual way is to, uh, is to minimize the least square error given by the integral of f of x minus y square and zero. Uh, so one could uh, minimize this error and uh, one will get the regression function defined uh, by the following uh, integral. But in general, I mean, we don't now uh, row, so one has to discretize uh, uh, this uh, criterion. And then we also uh, add the regularization parameter to, to, to get uh, a solution for this, uh, for this uh, minimization problem. And uh, yeah, so here the regularization term will be uh, in, the, in the RKHS. So the minimization is uh, taken over functions from a hypothesis space, often taken to be a ball in the, uh, in the RKHS HK associated to the reproducing kernel. And uh, we get an easy uh, close expression of this uh, function. It's the sum of CJ, KX, XJ. And then if uh, you remember, I mean, this is exactly the canonical feature map, uh, which, is the, which means that FS of X will be written as <coughs> Uh, can be written as the sum of cj uh, phij of x, uh, which is, uh, we could already see here that this is like linear in phij. So one of the nice features here is that one could write f of x as a linear combination of uh, this uh, variables phij of x in the RKHS. And the cj's themselves, I mean, they do satisfy a system of linear uh, equations that are given by the following, uh, by the, the following set of equations here. And so we call learning uh, the process of approximating the, the unknown function f from random samples on, uh, on Z. <coughs> Another thing that we'll be uh, using in this uh, work is the, the empirical kernel matrix whose entries are uh, k, x, i, x, j. Uh, the restriction operator, which is defined as, as the follow. So you take a function and then the rx applied to f is uh, f, x, i for i varying from 1 to m. And then the adjoint of the restriction operator, which is given by the following uh, expression. Uh, another application of uh, RKHS is the RKHS in the change point detection, where we are interested in the sequence of samples x1 to xn from a domain x. And then one is interested in detecting a possible change point tau, such that before tau, the samples xi follow probability distribution p, and then uh, which is the background distribution. And after the change point, the, the samples follow the probability distribution Q, and one wants to, to find that, uh, that change point. So here, with the approach that will be adopted is to map the data set in RKHS and then compute a measure of discrepancy. And delta N will be small if P is equal to Q and large if P and Q are far apart. And we'll be using the metric, which is called the maximum discrepancy that was intro intro introduced by Gaetan in the late 2000s which is essentially uh, the difference between the canon mean embeddings of the probability measure. And this is what we'll be using as a measure of uh, heterogeneity. So uh, yeah, so what happens here is that we take probability measure and then we embed it into an RKHS by considering its canon mean embedding that is defined by the following integral. And then the MMD uh, between two probability metrics, but between two probability measure is defined as the, the following distance between two such mapping. Uh, in, in the RKHS. So this, uh, yeah, this can be defined uh, explicitly in terms of the kernel. So one doesn't have to go into, into a feature space. 
So it is a pseudometric because uh, it doesn't satisfy uh, all the conditions. So it satisfy almost all the conditions, except that uh, the fact that it's zero doesn't imply that it is, uh, that P and Q is equal, uh, P and Q are equal. So for it to be a metric, it is sufficient that the kernel is characteristic. Uh, that is that the mapping uh, from P to H is injective. And this is satisfied by uh, uh, the Gaussian kernel, for example, on compact uh, domains or on RD. <coughs> so that's an illustration of what, what happens. For example, in this setting, you have two probability measures P and Q. So one maps them into their IKHS and computes the distance uh, between their means. And then one gets uh, this metric. And then here, for example, uh, you have this uh, two probabilities, uh, red and blue. And uh, so this uh, MMD is maximal when the, the, the two uh, probabilities are far apart. <coughs> and uh, yeah, one interesting result is that this uh, probability metric is uh, guarantees that we have convergence in distribution if and only if we have convergence in MMD. And uh, one of the advantages that is it can be computed directly from data without having to estimate the density as an intermediate step as many of uh, other metrics. Uh, and then uh, we'll be using this expression here, where uh, given two samples, uh, x1 to x, m from p, and y1 to y, m from q, and m by its estimate of the MMD is uh, directly obtained through, uh, through this expression. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so now we are going to look at the question of how uh, to choose the, the kernel. So, uh, yeah, so there is the, this method of kernel flows that was introduced uh, last year by Human Ohadi from, uh, from Caltech. So given an output, an input output uh, data, x1, uh, y1 to x and y n, and then we are same interested in uh, recovering an unknown function u star uh, from random samples. So in the setting of optimal recovery, the, the problem that we saw before uh, was ill posed. I mean, that, this is where the regularization <coughs> came in, but it can be turned into well posed uh, problem by restricting candidates for you to belong to a, to a Banach space. Uh, yeah, with a certain norm that, uh, yeah, the, that uh, I didn't write here. Uh, and then identifying the optimal recovery as the minimizer of the relative error that is defined by the following, uh, uh, yeah, the, the following uh, problem. So uh, the minimization over V of, uh, and then followed by maximization of, over U. So here the unknown function is U and then V is the, the approximate. So max is taken over u, and then the mean is taken over candidates in uh, in v in the same Banach space, such that uh, v x i is equal to u x i is equal to y i. And uh, so the method of uh, kernel flows is based on the premise that uh, kernel is good if there is no significant loss in accuracy in the prediction error if the number of data points is half. And so this led to uh, to the introduction of uh, of that row that we talked about, which is the norm of V star minus V S uh, square over norm of V star square. So where V star is the, yeah, V star is the, is the true function and then V S is the, is the random sample, yeah. And this can be expressed directly using this uh, form of the general, of the represented theorem, which is given here. <coughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, so uh, what, what happens now is that if one has a family of kernels, uh, k theta x, x prime that are parameterized by, by theta. So here I will be talking about the parametric version of, of kernel flows. There's a non-parametric version, which is about uh, deforming the space, but I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll not uh, be talking about it here. Uh, so the kernel flow algorithm in this uh, setting is that we select, uh, uh, so we have a, a data set. So first we start with the, with the subsample, and then we take a sub subsample, and then we compute the row. Uh, so yc is the sub subsample, and then yf is the, the subsample, and then k theta is the, the kernel uh, covariance matrix for the sub subsample and subsample. And then we perform uh, gradient descent over row, and then update the parameters of, uh, of the kernel according to that algorithm, and then repeat until we get, uh, until we get convergence. So uh, yeah, so now we uh, apply this to, to the context of dynamics. So we'll, I'll assume that we have a uh, time series, uh, x1 uh, to uh, xk. And then our goal is to forecast xn plus one from uh, observations uh, x1 to xn. Uh, so we work on the assumption that this time series can be approximated by a solution of dynamical system of the form zk plus one is equal to f dagger zk to zk minus uh, 
Stroh dagger plus one. So F dagger may be N now. So uh, yeah, so what we want to do is just uh, essentially uh, apply uh, the problem of approximating an unknown function from random samples, but we'll be using the canon flaws I mean, uh, and then see what, uh, what happens. Uh, so, um, so given our producing can have a space uh, of candidates for uh, F dagger and then using the relative error in the RKHS norm that uh, we introduced earlier, which is the, the raw function, the interponent admits the, the, yeah, the final representation, but then we'll be using a regularization here for the, you know, to, to allow for, uh, for inversion. <laughs> and then in the dynamic context, I mean, we are going to uh, also use uh, different variants of kernel flows. Uh, so here, I'm, you know, so we see mostly uh, the kernel flows as, as a philosophy instead of just a method on its own. So the first variant of kernel flows is the one that was introduced by, uh, by, uh, by human uh, like last year. But then we can also think about uh, metric associated to uh, Lyapunov exponents and the premise is that the kernel is good if the estimate of the Lyapunov exponent obtained for, from the kernel approximation of the dynamics does not change if half of the data is used. So we use this raw L uh, lambda max N minus lambda max N over two. But also, I mean, this can be modified as uh, like uh, suggested that by Ludmia about uh, I think two or three weeks ago in this uh, school in Pizza. So we can also uh, think about all the Lyapunov exponents. So it doesn't have to be only uh, the, the maximal Lyapunov of expand, but it could be uh, a row L where we are interested in uh, minimizing a row associated to all Lyapunov of expand. And then <coughs> third one would be a metric associated to, to the MMD. And uh, yeah, so this would be a row, minimized row MMD given by the MMD between uh, S1 and S2, which are two different samples of the, of the time series. Or you can take one sample and then uh, one uh, subsample and then run the the, the method on it, yeah. So we'll be using this, <coughs> uh, yeah, use, using this kernel, I mean, here uh, with the 10 uh, parameters. Yeah, so, um, and then the goal is the, to learn these parameters from the time series, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you apply it for, uh, for the Bernoulli map. And then we see here uh, that, uh, yeah, so we are comparing between cases where the, the initial kernel uh, it remains the same. There is no learning of the kernel, uh, and then <laughs> so here. So the, this is the figure with with the red and the blue. So this is where, without learning the kernel, and then with learning the kernel, it's the the one on the left. So it's a, it's almost uh, identical, and then we have also the, this one here where the blue is the true uh, trajectory, the red is the with the kernel after learning, and the green is for the kernel uh, without learning. Uh, so uh, that's uh, yeah, that's one thing. And another thing is about uh, the, the Lorentz uh, system. Uh, so we apply the same uh, same kind of same kernel, and then we uh, predict uh, the dynamics for uh, yeah for the three uh, states, and that also gives uh, interesting results. So uh, this is for the short term, but also uh, interestingly, uh, yeah, sorry here that there is also here this like different uh, different rows uh, and different. Uh, Different components. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, we, we apply the three different rows of the, the one corresponding to the, to the RKHS norm, the other one for the Lyapunov, maximal Lyapunov exponents, and the other one with the, with the MMD. <coughs> and then, yes, yeah, so here, these are like a, an approximation of the attractors. So you see that uh, for, the, uh, yeah, for the first, third, and the fifth figure, we are having an approximation of the uh, of the attractor without with learning the kernel, and then the uh, second, uh, fourth, and sixth. Uh, so it's uh, after learning the kernel, which you, you see, so one sees improvement in the approximation of the long term behavior. So here, uh, again, it's, it's not only about approximating um, or making prediction of time series. We also are interested in uh, qualitative theory of, of dynamics. So we are interested in also uh, uh, long term behavior. And uh, yeah, that's the reconstruction of the attractor in, in 3D. So we see, we see improvement in, uh, in, the, in the estimation through, uh, yeah, through learning the kernel. And uh, yeah, recently in the, yeah, the last, I think two or three months, so uh, we also started working on the prediction of uh, <coughs> climate data that was pro provided to us by, uh, uh, Ramit Malik from the Argonne uh, National Laboratory. So here we see, I mean, there is an example of uh, temperature prediction 
I think it was in Chicago. And then we see, I mean, that we have the true data is the, the red one that is directly provided by, uh, by satellite. And then the other, two other ones are, uh, <coughs> are provided by different uh, methods to solve the PDEs uh, exactly. And then the, the blue one is through kernel flows uh, that, is, uh, that we did run on uh, my just personal uh, laptop. And then we see that uh, essentially we are performing, uh, um, are having a good performance. This is for uh, temperature prediction. And then also for applications in the, for the entire profile, I mean, we also got some uh, data sets. So Romit was able to, to get uh, this for, for the entire prof uh, profile. Uh, and then you see we are comparing between, uh, yeah, true data set, uh, kernel flows, PDE uh, based short term, and then PDE based long term. And uh, yeah, so it seems, I mean, that it's doing all right. I mean, there's probably room for improvement, especially for this uh, vertices, uh, vertices in, uh, yeah, in green here. So uh, yeah, so we are working on this uh, kind of, of improvement, but so it's probably, imp so so far, so for this, we, uh, we used the uh, kernel with 30 parameters where we used the, uh, yeah, the triangular kernel, locally periodic kernel, and then uh, polynomial, and then many other, other ones. So we just combined between all of them. And then we, we did run uh, <coughs> kernel flows. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to see what, uh, how, yeah, how this compares to, uh, yeah, to Juan Pablo's uh, results and then all, uh, all the other work on uh, reservoir computing. So I'm not sure, I'm still not clear uh, totally what's the, what are the links, but I guess that there are probably links between uh, reservoir computers and, uh, and kernel flows. <coughs> uh, another application is the detection of uh, critical transitions for uh, multi-scale uh, systems. Uh, so we are here. We are. We looked only uh, at this particular kind of SDEs, where it's slow, fast uh, system, uh, and then we were able to show that for this kind of uh, particular class of system, the MMD uh, uh, allows to detect uh, critical transition, and then it's maximal at at the critical points. So, so here I'm just going to go uh, quickly uh, through this because I don't think I have I have a lot of time. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we look at the stochastic van der Poel uh, case, and then. Uh, which has uh, some uh, some critical points here, which are like periodic, and then we uh, we show that the MMD is maximal at uh, at this critical point. So what remains to be proven here is uh, whether we can uh, extract an early warning signal or not. So that's uh, still not clear yet. But yeah, so maybe uh, with kernel flows that can be uh, that can be done. <coughs> uh, so another uh, application is to look at the approximation of control systems uh, in RKHS. Uh, so uh, yeah, so for this work and the and the, the next one yeah. about and then and then the other one about uh, SDEs. Uh, so we want to look at uh, uh, we are interested in looking at uh, linear theory as a paradigm for nonlinear systems. So we want to use linear theory and uh, and apply it directly in the RKHS to a nonlinear system that is being embedded into an RKHS. So in the case of uh, context of nonlinear control systems, we we are going to look at uh, at balancing. So we consider a linear control system x dot is equal to ax plus bu and uh, y is equal to cx, where a b is uh, controllable and ac is observable, uh, and then uh, a has uh, eigenvalues on the uh, left open half plane. So we define uh, controllability and observability gramians as the following objects wc and wo. And these two matrices can be viewed as a measure of the controllability and the observability of the system. So essentially, they are directly related to, uh, to the following uh, energies. So LC uh, is defined uh, as the minimal energy required to reach x not from 0 in infinite time, so, uh, which is defined by the following integral. And then we define LO as the future energy, which is defined as the output energy regenerated by releasing the system from uh, its initial state x not and then uh, 0 input. So that's uh, LO. <coughs> so from linear control theory, so this LC and LO may have a closed expression that is uh, given by the following uh, expression, which is LC is half of uh, X0 transpose WC minus one X0, and LO uh, is half of X0 transpose WO uh, X, X0, with WC and WO satisfying the following uh, Lyapunov equations. So here the observation is that uh, LC and LO, they can be written in terms of inner product. And then the goal is to, uh, to approximate uh, the, this similar objects for nonlinear systems 
using, using this observation that LC and LO uh, can be written in terms of, uh, of inner products. And so one will map the solutions of, uh, of the nonlinear system uh, in Rn into, uh, into H through an embedding. And then we would try to see if there is a way to get this uh, similar observations for the, for the nonlinear system. So uh, yeah, so uh, these Gramians, I mean, WC and LO and uh, WO have been used uh, a lot in the linear control theory and then specifically for the, for the purpose of model reduction. And uh, the goal here in the, in the method of balancing is to find a representation where the system's observable and controllable subspaces are aligned so that reduction, if possible, consists of eliminating uncontrollable states, which are also the least observable. So one is interested in looking at the input output behavior of the control system. And then the, the, the claim is that uh, the states that are hard to reach, i.e. the ones that require a lot of uh, energy from, uh, from the input, so, so when LC is large, and then that do not uh, generate a lot of energy at the output, so i.e. the, the LO is, is small, then these states are not, import, uh, are not import, important and so one can, uh, could uh, discard them. So uh, one is interested in finding a coordinate system where the, the measures of uh, controllability and observability, the WC and WO, uh, are aligned, so they are equal, and then we get uh, this will be equal to some matrix sigma, uh, and so the entries of this uh, sigma uh, uh, once diagonalized will, uh, will give us a clear understanding of the input output behavior and then one would look for, uh, for a spectral gap and then eliminate the, the ones, the, the states where, where uh, uh, sigma k to sigma n are, are small. So we are interested in finding uh, a t such that uh, t w c t transpose, uh, so which is the t is the transformation, the balancing transformation is equal to t minus t w o t minus one is equal to uh, to sigma. So once we uh, <coughs> get this, then uh, balancing becomes uh, an easy task between codes. Uh, and so we are, are looking for a k such that sigma k is much greater than sigma k plus one. And then if we get this, then uh, xk plus one to, to xn will be uh, assumed to make a negligible uh, contribution. And to find uh, such a t, uh, one, there are many methods, but the easiest way is to look at the Cholesky decomposition of uh, WO, uh, get a matrix Z, and then perform an SVD of uh, Z transpose WCZ, and uh, from there get this transformation. So our goal will be uh, to, uh, to look for, uh, yeah, for generalization of this into, uh, for, for linear systems, and this is what uh, what uh, yeah, what uh, we did in uh, yeah in this work. Yeah, for nonlinear systems, I mean, the, as I mentioned, there have been some work, especially uh, due to Sharpen, where she looked at uh, nonlinear systems of the, the following form, uh, so which are affine in the input, and uh, she proved that uh, yeah, so the LC and LO satisfy uh, uh, two uh, equations. The LO is the Lyapunov equation. And LC uh, is a Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation. And so these uh, two PDEs are not uh, yeah, that easy to solve. Uh, and there have been a lot of work uh, trying to find approximate solutions uh, for them. And then she proved also that there is a balancing transformation under certain conditions. So one could diagonalize both uh, solutions and end up having a, a balancing transformation. So as I mentioned, there have been a lot of work trying to solve these two PDEs and then compute uh, the coordinate x equal to phi of z, but there are there is no systematic method. So there have been some uh, uh, methods based on Taylor series expansion or using uh, statistical approximation uh, where the system is excited with white Gaussian noise <coughs> and then computing a balancing transformation using an algorithm from differential topology. There have been some uh, essentially linear uh, empirical work when uh, one looks at uh, yeah, at the linear approximation. So what we want to do is, uh, as I said, we want to use uh, linear theory of the nonlinear control system in, in the RKHS, and then you apply uh, linear balancing in the RKHS and then get uh, an approximation of the original uh, nonlinear system. So uh, yeah, so in uh, yeah, a linear case, as we saw before, uh, there is a way to uh, find an analytic, uh, an analytic solution by solving two uh, Lyapunov equations. Uh, there is a database approach where one excites the, the system with the uh, impulses from the input 
uh, and then impulses from, uh, from the initial condition, someone will come up with two covariance matrices. And then uh, when one will get, uh, uh, yeah, one will uh, diagonalize them and then uh, perform, uh, then uh, get a balance transformation. So that's just the way of uh, discretizing the, the integral. And that is exactly what you are going to do in, in, in the RKHS, except that uh, these objects, I mean, instead of being uh, covariance matrices, will end up being covariance uh, operator because we'll be working uh, essentially in uh, an RKHS, which is infinite dimensional. Um, so yeah, so this is what I was mentioning before, is that how to compute uh, com com probability and observability energies from data, uh, and then how to extend this previous approach uh, to nonlinear control systems. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, what will be uh, done through, uh, through feature maps. <coughs> um, yeah, so uh, what we do is uh, we consider a nonlinear control system of the form x dot is equal to uh, fxu and uh, y is equal to h of x. So as I mentioned before, uh, lc x naught is equal to half uh, of x0 transpose wc minus one x0 uh, can be rewritten as the following inner product. So it's uh, wc uh, pseudo inverse x naught with x naught and uh, with times one half and then lo which is half of x0 transpose uh, w o uh, x naught can be written as the inner product of half of uh, inner product w o uh, x0 with, uh, with x0. So essentially we are attempted by saying that, yeah, since this is like an inner product and using the kernel trick, uh, LC can be written as uh, WC uh, pseudo inverse H with H and LO with B uh, W O H with, with H with H is the, is the embedding. Yeah, however, I mean, there, are, there are some complications because we'll be working in uh, some uh, infinite dimensional space. So uh, and then essentially about, yeah, this uh, operator that is, uh, that is here and the same one, the W sub so the inverse and the, the WO. Uh, so questions of invertibility and uh, yeah. Yeah, and the being uh, and, and domain of definition. So yeah, so we could uh, show using this uh, operator that we talked about before, the restriction operator and its adjoint. That, uh, that we have a closed expression for, uh, for LC hat, uh, which is given by the following form. And uh, similarly, we have a closed expression for, uh, for LO hat using uh, this uh, kind of uh, computations and kernel trick, and then using this restriction operator and this adjoint. So one could get a, a closed expression for the solutions of, um, at least an approximation of the LC and L hot using the kernel, uh, LC and uh, L O hat uh, using this uh, kernel tree. So the approach is, uh, is as follows. I mean, we consider a nonlinear system of the form <coughs> X dot is equal to F X U and Y is equal to H of X. So we assume that you can apply uh, the method of linear balancing when the system is lifted uh, to high, uh, possibly infinite dimensional feature space carry out uh, linear balancing and truncation using exactly the same uh, approach in the, in the case of uh, linear balancing. And then uh, we discard an important state and then construct a, a nonlinear reduced order model by learning approximations to FH defined directly on the reduced state space. Uh, yeah, so here, as I mentioned before, the Gramian, uh, the empirical Gramian in RN becomes uh, uh, the following expression, because the, the X will be mapped into the RKHS. So the, this becomes a covariance operator. So that's an example of uh, what we will get uh, in H. But again, luckily we don't have to, 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 to go into, the, uh, into that route. I mean, you could uh, just uh, apply, compute the kernel covariance matrices in, in the RKHS and then perform linear balancing. Like, uh, like being done in, uh, in the linear case. So that's exactly what we, we do here. So we have, we compute KC and KO, perform an SVD and then compute the balancing transformation into, into the RKHS and then look for a spectral gap. And then from there, we're going to get uh, an approximation of the nonlinear system uh, using uh, this, uh, this approach. So that's just an academic example. We have like seven uh, dimensional system. So we excite it with the impulses from the input and, 
and the initial condition. We co construct the co canal covariance matrices, and then we do uh, balancing. Um, yeah, so here, so uh, this is like the, so how, uh, yeah, which kind of input we use for testing, which is sign sum uh, of sign and, uh, and uh, yeah, and, um, yeah, this square, square matrix, uh, square uh, input. Uh, so uh, we can compute this kernel covariance matrices. Uh, so uh, here, so we look at the first 100 uh, singular values, which is the, the red, red one here. I and mean, there's another example in 2D, but here I'm just going to talk about the 7D example. And we see that there is a spectral gap between uh, the second and the third one of order 100. So the first one and the second one are of the same order. So uh, yeah, so we are going to assume that, uh, see that uh, the system is going to be uh, model reducible to, uh, to dimension two. Uh, and uh, that's what we see, uh, that, that uh, this is what we uh, check in, in the, the simulation. So we have this control input. Uh, so the original uh, output is uh, the blue one and the reduced is the, is the red one. And you see that they are uh, uh, close to each other. <coughs> uh, other, uh, yeah, other application is SDEs in uh, LKHS. So here we adopt again the same uh, same philosophy. We are interested in seeing uh, if there is a way to uh, to use linear theory as a paradigm uh, to estimate quantities for nonlinear SDEs once mapped into an LKHS. So the, what we are going to look at is the SDEs that are excited with the, with the white Gaussian noise. Uh, so, we, uh, so here we have a control input, uh, we have control system, we're excited with the white Gaussian noise. And then we want to look at the stationary solution of uh, the focal Planck equation that is given uh, by the following uh, object. And we are going to, to use the linear estimate as a, as a basis for, uh, for to estimate the, the nonlinear uh, a nonlinear object. So, uh, so for linear systems uh, that are excited with white Gaussian noise, I mean, we know uh, that it's uh, sufficient to find the mean and the covariance of the solution xt in order to uniquely uh, determine the transition probability density. And uh, and we can also uh, express the yeah, the, yeah, so the mean, so here is if A is stable, so the limit, the mean will be zero. The covariance satisfies uh, the Lyapunov equation for WC that we saw before, which is AQ plus uh, QA transpose equal to minus VB transpose. And um, which is exactly the, the WC. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so essentially, I mean, uh, one guess that the steady state probability density uh, for the linear setting is uh, rho infinity is uh, proportional to uh, exponential minus LC, so this is minus exponential minus half X transpose WC minus one X. And then this is exactly what we had for LC. And uh, so what we want to see is uh, whether there, this is uh, going to be useful for uh, some uh, other nonlinear SDEs as, uh, as an estimate. So as I said, I mean, even though this estimate here, uh, rho infinity hat uh, is uh, being proportional to exponential minus LC hat is uh, valid only for a small class of systems, linear and some Hamiltonian systems. So what we want to see is, uh, yeah, if mapping a nonlinear system into a suitable RKHS, is it possible to extend this connection to, uh, to a larger class of, uh, of nonlinear systems? So uh, yeah, so what, uh, what are the assumptions is that we assume that, uh, yeah, we have this SDE uh, that is uh, here. And then we assume that there is a fee uh, that, uh, that maps the solution of this SDE into an OU process in the, in, in the Hilbert space. That's the first assumption. Yeah, so characterizing the class of SDEs for which this is possible, I'm still, yeah, so there is an open uh, question. So I'm, I'm not totally clear. Uh, under which conditions the, this assumption is, is possible. Uh, but it seems to be reasonable for some uh, SDEs, as we'll see in, in an example that I'm going to, to, show, to show in a moment. Uh, second one is that the measure P infinity, that is the invariant measure of the OU process uh, is the, the push forward along phi of the unknown invariant measure. So uh, since we know that the OU process uh, 
uh, we know what is the yeah what is the uh, p infinity for the OU process in H. I mean the goal is to see uh, if we can get this back uh, for the original uh, nonlinear SDE in in Rn, and then we also assume that uh, mu infinity uh, admits uh, admits a density. Yeah, and then we uh, yeah, and I said that's the main. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so that's the main estimate that we are having here. So we proved some uh, results for uh, like statistical uh, results, like a consistency, consistency results for, uh, for these estimates in, in the paper. Uh, so here, what I'm going to just show is the like, numerical experiment. So, uh, so we have this double well potential where we have two bumps. Uh, and then you see that by, uh, yeah, so uh, numerically estimating it is the is the black one and then the green one is through uh, through the RKHS estimate using uh, using the one I I mentioned before so even though it has two uh, two bumps I mean it could have been I mean it was we were able to recover it using uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, that uh, yeah we could, using the linear estimate for uh, for the OU process in uh, in H. Uh, yeah, so another application is the construction of Lyapunov functions from, uh, from data. So here we are interested in uh, uh, the following problem is that given nonlinear uh, ODE x dot is equal to f of x, to so assume that we don't know f, but we have x of ti's. Uh, so uh, the, we appro will approximate f from uh, x of ti's. We find the Lyapunov function v hat for, uh, for f hat. And then we prove that v hat is also the upon a function for uh, for f. That's the the strategy here. And um, yeah, as you may know, the upon functions are, are are important in nonlinear system theory uh, because they allow, for example, to to prove stability, but they also allow to uh, to uh, to estimate uh, the basin of attraction uh, directly from the upon function. So this would be the assumption here that we assume that the zero is an equilibrium point that it is exponentially uh, asymptotically stable. And then uh, one could estimate uh, the basin of attraction from the level sets of the, of the Lyapunov function. <coughs> yeah, so what is the Lyapunov function? It's, uh, yeah, it's positive definite function uh, such that it's uh, orbital derivative uh, defined by the, the following object. So the inner product of the gradient of V with F is, uh, is strictly negative. Uh, so it can be less or equal to zero, but then one has to use the Lassalle's uh, invariance theorem to prove uh, stability. Um, and then as I mentioned, I mean, one could look at uh, level sets of the Lyapunov function to get uh, domains of, uh, of attraction. So uh, one, uh, one of the ways of constructing Lyapunov function is to, uh, to, uh, to solve uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, Differential uh, this kind of PDEs. So uh, remember the, the the main condition on the Lyapunov function is that its orbital derivative is is negative, which is like a differential inequality. But one could look also at uh, uh, some uh, some PDEs where one fixes uh, the right hand side. Uh, for example, here a, a norm of uh, x minus norm of x square. But this I mean has been uh, yeah extended to some classes of uh, functions uh, uh, where the right-hand side is some function that satisfies certain uh, conditions and uh, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and then one solves uh, term by term uh, this, uh, this PDE. So that's the, uh, the idea of uh, Peter Giesel where he pro proposed an algorithm for approximate the upon of functions using uh, radial basis functions. Uh, so it's based on uh, finding an approximate solution of uh, this linear PDE. And in general, with the, uh, yeah, so as I said, it's either minus norm of x square, which is the most popular choice, but sometimes it's better to use the uh, other kinds of p's. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so what he showed that if the p satisfies the following condition that it's positive, then it's uh, of this uh, order eta, and then as well at the, this uh, following condition, then there exists the upper function such that. Uh, LV1 uh, is equal to minus P of X uh, for all X in the, in, the, uh, in the basin of attraction of X not which is the equilibrium point. <coughs> so how does the, uh, I mean, this algorithm works? I mean, it works on a similar premise that one can use uh, 
linear theory uh, in the in the in the RKHS. So here the RKHS is uh, is found by a Van Lant function, so the kernel is is, is fixed. Uh, and so uh, the only difference here is that this is like a generalized interpolation problem, where the the coefficients become uh, differentiation, so it becomes a differential operator. So here, you see this there is this extra term here, which is delta x k composed with L. So L uh, denotes differentiation with respect to y, and then followed by uh, uh, evaluation at y is equal to x k. So, um, so before the, uh, so remember like we had this problem of uh, approximating an unknown function from random sample. So here, the coefficients become, uh, yeah, will will involve the differentiation uh, uh, in them. But still, I mean, you see the structure is still uh, is still linear, uh, and then. Uh, uh, to find this coefficient, one uses uh, one, one could solve this uh, system of linear equations again for the coefficients, and then get uh, yeah the solution of the an approximation of the solution of the PDE. And then this is a proof that uh, yeah that uh, Giesel introduced which, uh, with Bandland, which uh, to show that uh, yeah the Lyapunov function, which is an approximation of the the solution of the PDE, is also Lyapunov function for the for the original system. So what we want to do is, I mean, yeah. So is to generalize this work to the case where f is not known, uh, and then so uh, we assume that we have uh, unknown samples x i y i. So uh, uh, for, from the from the dynamical system, and then we want to find the Lyapunov function based on this uh, on this kind of uh, assumption that we don't know the right hand side of the ODE, but we know uh, the the data from it. So uh, yeah, and then we proved actually that the, yeah this is possible. So we by by finding a good approximation of the f, uh, we could show that we, we could find the Lyapunov function uh, for the approximated uh, dynamical system, and then this Lyapunov function itself is an approximation of the Lyapunov function of the original system, and this is just an example uh, where uh, we uh, now have the Lyapunov function here just a quadratic function, and uh, yeah so we see. That this is the numerical experiment showing the Lyapunov function with uh, when we increase the number of points. So here it's 360, and then uh, we have uh, 1,000 uh, points. And then we see that the orbital derivative uh, is decreasing by the number of points. So here we had like some sharp edges, but then by increasing the number of points, we get a negative definiteness of the of the orbital derivative. <coughs> uh, so last part is the about center manifold approximation. Uh, so Demi, that, Demi, yeah. I think, uh, we uh, we would like to have a few minutes at least for questions. Uh, yeah, okay. I think people probably will. Some people will have to leave uh, on an hour. Uh, yeah. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I'll be finishing quickly here. So I'm almost done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we. Uh, yeah. So we are just going to quickly about this. So uh, yeah, we have a, a center manifold theorem uh, we, where we are interested in analyzing. Uh, the stability of uh, of this equilibrium point, uh, where we have uh, some eigenvalues on the imaginary axis and other ones on the left uh, open half plane. Uh, so um, we use the center manifold uh, theorem to to show that the stability properties of the full order system uh, depend actually on the on the reduced order system uh, whose linear part is on the imaginary axis. Uh, so that's the center manifold theorem. And, uh, and this center manifold satisfies this PDE, which is given here. And then what we did is uh, to, to, uh, to solve this uh, PDE using uh, kernel methods. And we also uh, got uh, a kernelized version of the center manifold theorem that shows that uh, we are able to prove stability of the full order system from the stability of the reduced order system on the approximation of the center manifold uh, theorem. Uh, by using the solution uh, that we got for of the of the PDE uh, that uh, defines the center manifold, <coughs> that's the the theta. So by getting approximation of the theta from the data, we get uh, an approximation of the dynamics, and then by studying its proper stability properties, we get uh, the same stability properties of the full order system. So that's an example uh, where we uh, illustrate this kind of things. I mean, we have uh, x dot is equal to x y, whether they have one. Uh, eigenvalue on the imaginary axis and another one here it's uh, so the, this is like a negative and so uh, by looking at two different kernels so here the analytically can, one can find the center manifold 
And then by looking at two different kernels, we show that we effectively have an approximation of the sample naive. Uh, yeah, okay, and that's it. Yeah, so uh, to conclude, uh, we used, uh, yeah, sorry, we used kind of loss to approximate uh, chaotic dynamical systems. So we also uh, showed that the maximum discrepancy can be used to detect uh, critical transitions. So we introduced estimators for the contrariety and observability energies that were used to model uh, for model approximation of nonlinear control systems. And these were also used to estimate uh, the stationary solution of the Foucault Planck equation uh, governing uh, some nonlinear SDEs using linear estimates. And so this, uh, yeah, these um, results show that RKHS uh, do act as a linearizing space. So we also introduced a database approach of the, for the construction of Lyapunov of functions, a center manifold approximation and the database version of the center manifold theorem. And uh, so these results collectively argue that working in uh, reproducing kind of herbal spaces uh, offers tools for database theory of uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. And uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's the take home message. And these are like some uh, list of, uh, of references. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. I mean, So we. <laughs> yeah, so sorry we... for going over time. I didn't realize actually that. Yeah, yeah so we, uh, sorry. So we don't really have time for many questions, but you know, if, uh, if people would like to ask questions, please do. You can unmute yourself and just ask directly, or you can just put it in the chat, but uh, whatever uh, is good. I would have a question if possible. Ah, Gabriel, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> I'm already in. So thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a question, two questions actually on the camera flows. So one is I, I get the philosophical idea of leaving out alpha of the point and training the kernel on half of them. But is there a particular reason for using half the point or not? So do, do you ever investigate other techniques to leave out something else? And yes, yes, yes. So the, yes. Half of the point. Yeah, let me just answer one by now, one, so that I may forget the first question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the, yeah, half of the point, I mean, there, there is it actually, because the, in the original paper, they talked about half of the point. But then I tried actually to have like just a random variable between zero and one, and then this worked quite well. So. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so the, I think the half of the point is just like say that you are using a random uh, sub sub sample. Yeah, but so half is yeah. About, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, there is nothing special about it as far as I understand. Yeah. And, and the other point in the experiment that you show that uh, it looks really like the, the kernel that you learn by that kernel flow is much better in predicting the, the, the behavior of the system. But my question is if uh, the evolution that you have shown is the same that you use for training. So do you learn a kernel that is really good also uh, to predict your dynamical system outside of the training data or the experiment that you have shown is only showing the error on the training data? So oh, yeah, how, so how good is to generalize, let's say? Yeah, so, here, yeah, so this is, yeah. So, the, so here we use this for uh, for testing points, right? I mean, it's not for, for the training points. So the, the results I was showing were for different initial condition. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, but of course, I mean, all right. I mean, here, like, uh, how, yeah. So, sorry, I'm to, to charge my uh, my battery is dying. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So as I said, I mean, it's uh, yeah. So it's good to have uh, you can estimate for different uh, initial conditions. And then actually, I, I started like looking at this uh, analytically speaking by using similar arguments as uh, uh, Ed Ott's paper, where you could compute the Lyapunov exponents uh, to between the an original system and uh, an approximation using kernels, but I think there is there is probably a way to characterize this uncertainty, yeah, using the oh. exponents. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, yeah, my other option is also to look at this kind of arguments that uh, Juan Pablo and Ludmilla use in their work on reservoir computing to to show a learnability and an approximability. But I still don't know okay. uh, all the okay. details about their work, so I think it would be nice to, to see this. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a question from Gosia Kowalska. How Hilbert kernel approach compares to other linearization decomposition methods, for example, Koopman operator methods? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think philosophically uh, there is a difference in the sense that here we don't assume that uh, the, the, the dynamics of the observables is linear. Right? I mean, this is what I mentioned at the beginning that 
uh, the goal is to apply linear theory in the RKHS. And we don't assume that the system is linear in the RKHS. So it could be uh, possible that the system in the RKHS, whether a dynamical system like autonomous or control or random dynamical system, it could be the, that it is linear, but it doesn't have to. So it could be uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's not linear, but the goal is to uh, apply linear theory to it. So that's, uh, I think, what I see as a philosophical difference. But I see definitely, you are right, I, mean, I see definitely the point, and there's probably a link there, which, which, is, which needs to be explored. But I see that there is a slight difference in the, in the approaches that one is assuming uh, linear dynamics uh, in the higher dimensional space, and the other one is uh, assuming uh, that the linear theory applies there. So it could be that the system is linear or not linear, but you apply linear theory to it. Yeah. Right. Uh, Andrew Flynn, um, uh, is it possible to find a, sing find a single kernel that can produce the dynamics of two different chaotic attractors? Is it possible to find a single kernel that can produce the dynamics of two different chaotic Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, this could be, I don't know exactly. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good question, yeah. Uh, but it depends on what you mean, right? I mean, uh, yeah, so here I have, you, you mean like you, one kernel that approximates two dynamical systems or in the long run or? <clears throat> hi, hi, um, so what I'm, what I'm asking is, so I'm coming from the reservoir computer side and uh, what I'm interested in is multifunctionality. So a single network that can perform two different tasks. So say for instance, you find a kernel that can reproduce the dynamics of the Lawrence attractor find a kernel that can reproduce the dynamics of the Rossler attractor. Could you find a single kernel that could do both? Yeah, but you, but you probably have to, to retrain, right? Um, so what I do with my, my, my reservoir is I find, I have training data for both and I'm able to have a single readout matrix that can perform the dynamics of either attractor. Oh, and okay, yeah, that's a good question, yeah. I don't know, as far as I see, uh, but I, I could be wrong. I, mean, I think that it's not possible uh, with this kind of approach because you are learning one kernel and then you fix the parameters and then you are able to get uh, one, uh, yeah, one dynamical system. And then if you want to get another dynamical system, you, you need to do uh, another training, but to get both with one training, I, mean, I doubt that this is possible. Yeah. So you are saying that with one training, you get both? With the reservoir, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Now here, I mean, as far as I see, I, mean, I, I think that's not possible because you do, you are training for one dynamical system. And then if you want to do another dynamical system, then you just have to, to retrain. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, unless you are looking for a vector valued kernel and then, uh, yeah, and then the coefficients will be, uh, instead of having scalar valued kernel, you would get like a vector valued kernel. And then you will have like two, uh, for example, two, uh, like the two entries for each uh, in front of each kernel, and then you train a first component, for example, for the first attractor and the second one of the second attractor. Yeah, like but with one like... single kernel, I mean, a scalar kernel, I, I doubt that it's possible. But if you want to go to vector value, then probably it's possible, yeah. But uh, okay, I thank think. you, Giannis um, Boltzinas. How can the method predict the Bernoulli map? The trajectory depends heavily on the initial condition. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's because, yeah, you're right. I mean, I had a lot of trouble actually to, to come up with the, with the solution of this. I think it's because of the nature of the kernel. I mean, the, the kernel, it was a trigonal kernel, so it was like a discontinuity. There was like some discontinuity in the kernel uh, that was approximating the discontinuity. Yeah, but you're right. The, the, but, uh, but also, I think it's probably also related to, uh, to Gabriel's uh, question, which is for uh, which kind of initial conditions you are able to, to get this kind of approximation. Yeah, so, so that's uh, different. Sorry, uh, the question is, was it one trajectory? Because if was we go, so because uh, the graph uh, that uh, you saw, uh, there was some prediction, but I don't understand, was it one trajectory? Because if we get two initial conditions, they may have nothing in common because it's just the binary expansion of, uh, it's a binary shift, right? And then training on one, could be nothing for the other. So I'm, I'm not sure how it can, I, yeah, I don't see how it can be I think it's just the kernel. I mean, I just the, the kernel was uh, sufficiently expressive. So that's it, yeah. I think that's the, the, the only uh, explanation I could have uh, for this kind of example, yeah. 
but then also, as I said, it's probably the initial conditions were, were close enough for this kind of things here. Yeah. Okay, so we'll need to finish very soon. So we have Jimmy Duan. How big is your problem? Are the methods scalable to large scale? The problem. So I, this probably has to do with the, the usual problem of kernel method. Yeah. Is there uh, another question? Is there any advantage of maximum discrepancy over KL divergence? Yeah. So yeah, some big uh, yeah, some big uh, yeah data for kernels. I mean, it's like it's an open. I think it's very common for kernel methods, as Peter knows. And then yeah, he also I think works a lot on this as well. Uh, yeah. So I think there are ways actually to solve this kind of problems. I think one uh, have to look at different ways of doing SVDs and uh, for kernel method. Uh, advantage of uh, MMD over KL divergence. Yes, I think this is the, yeah. So this is what I had in mind when I mentioned that one uh, could be expressed uh, directly using the data. And while K, uh, if you use KL divergence, you probably have to go to the intermediate step of computing the, estimating the probability from the data and then uh, finding the, the KL divergence from the estimates, yeah. I mean, this is what I see as, uh, as main difference, yeah. But they are doing essentially the same job, except that one is uh, can be computed directly from data, uh, and the other one requires uh, an intermediate step. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, right. Really enjoyed the presentation. So it was a very lively discussion. Um, I would just have a very very quick short one. Um, I didn't understand the invariant measure. So if you get the invariant measure in the feature space, how do you go back? Yeah, so that's the, yeah, that's the thing is that we, we just used the, this estimate, right? I mean, so we, we forced the estimate and then we, we didn't have to, to go back. So we just had this estimate. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, I mean, it was mostly of, uh, yeah, forcing okay. an estimate and see if it works. I mean, the, so it was, the, it was the kernel trick. So no need to go, to go back. It's uh, in terms of the kernel itself. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. So I, I, I would like to thank Boumedin again for a, for an exciting talk and, and very lively discussion at the end of the talk. And uh, thank you all for attending the talk.